Amen. Well, as we get into the Word of God this morning, we're going to go to Hebrews chapter 6, beginning at verse 9. We're going to read 9 through 15 and jump over to verse 19. Hebrews chapter 6, beginning at verse 9. It says, But beloved, we are convinced of better things concerning you. And that's the one verse that really spoke to me. It says, Beloved, we are convinced of better things concerning you and things that accompany salvation, though we are speaking in his way. For God is not unjust so as to forget your work and the love which you have shown towards his name in having ministered and all the ministering to his saints. And we desire that each one of you show the same diligence so as to realize the full assurance of hope and to the end, so that you will not be sluggish, but imitators of those who through faith and patience inherit the promise. For when God made the promise to Abraham, since he could swear by no one greater, he swore to himself, saying, I will surely bless you, I will surely multiply you. And so having patiently waited, he obtained the promise. And in verse 19, a popular verse, it says, this hope we have as an anchor. This hope we have is an anchor of the soul. A hope both sure and steadfast, and one which enters within the veil. And God says we have this hope like an anchor. And this morning, I want to preach to you shortly on the, the title of today's message. is Dangerous, Destructive, discouragement. Come on, say that with me. Dangerous, destructive, discouragement. I want to preach all about hope this morning. Father, bless this word. Give hope to those that are discouraged, as many are in the times we're living in. We may be discouraged because of the past. We may be discouraged because of the future or what we're going through at this present moment. But Father, it is not in us as your children to live a life of discouragement, but hope. So help me teach it. Help us to learn it in Jesus' name. Amen. <clears throat> Amen. You guys can have a seat as we get into this word this morning on dangerous, destructive discouragement. I want to tell you a story that happened to me about 10 plus years ago, a while ago. But a few years ago, I was on a cruise. And if you've ever been on the cruise, you know that excitement, that joy of the first day. How many of you have been on the cruise? You know the first day, the excitement that you're packed. It's stressful because you're, you don't want to be late. You're getting ready. You're getting the luggage. You're driving to the port. You're rushing through the, all, all the checkpoints. and You're doing all of that. But there's something that happens when you arrive on that ship. And once you cross onto the board, onto that ship, there's a release that says, oh, I finally made it. Now we're officially on vacation mode. And it is one of the best feelings ever as you go up to your room and you're looking at your room, you're looking at, you know, the ocean, you're doing all of that. And then you make your way on up to the Lido deck and everyone is so excited. And one of my favorite things about cruising is leaving the port because I get to be on the edge of the boat and I look at all the peasants down there in Miami just having to go work all week long. And there I am saying suckers and I'm just waving goodbye. How many can I get a witness this morning? You don't know what I'm talking about. That's right, you know. We got to pray for the peasants. So anyway, so I'm on the boat and I'm on the Lido deck. We're having a great time. Everyone is celebrating. Everyone's having a good time, relaxing. You've been there. You know, there's loud music. There, things are going. I mean, everyone's just having such a great time. But about three hours into this voyage, it started raining and raining and raining. And the rain did not stop. When I tell you it did not stop, I mean it. It did not stop. And it did not stop that afternoon. It did not stop that evening. It didn't stop the whole night through. It did not stop the next morning, the whole Monday at sea. It was nonstop rain. And people, you can see the joy in their face completely gone. You can see people where even though they're on vacation and having a good time, their people were just angry and angry and angry at the fact that the vacation is getting ruined. We can't go to the pool. We can't go to the jacuzzi. We can't do anything. Because all of this rain. And I was one of those people. I was mad. So anyway, that night, I went downstairs because wouldn't you know, one of the excursions I booked for the next day when we were going to Costa Rica was canceled, you guessed it, due to what? 
the weather, the rain. So I'm making this, this long line because they've called me. So you've got to go downstairs and rebook a different excursion. And you've got to hurry because all the other good excursions are going away. So imagine the stress. I go downstairs. I'm about to reschedule the excursion. But there's a massive line of angry people complaining about the weather, complaining about the change of plans, complaining about everything. And I'm one of them. So I'm there in the line. And you know when you want to be left alone, there's always that person that doesn't leave you alone. So I'm in the line. I'm waiting. And there's a woman. I'll never forget her. Her name's Laura from Ohio. I know this because she turns around and says, Hi, I'm Laura. I'm from Ohio. And I'm thinking, and? I don't want to talk to you. Leave me alone. But she just kept on and on and talking and talking. And I'm like, Laura, get the hint. Look around you. Everyone's angry. What is wrong with you? She was like all giddy and stuff. And I thought it was because she had a few drinks. She was a little drunk. And I know she was drunk. You know why? Because when she turns around and says, hi, I'm Laura, she goes, you know, you remind me if anyone ever told you, you look like Ricky Martin. <laughs> True story. And the first thing out of my mind was, how much have you had to drink? <laughs> True story. And I was laughing at that. I, I don't know. I'm, I, how many agree? I don't know. If you, okay, no, thank you. I know, I know, I know. <laughs> this was 10 years ago. Maybe 10 years ago I did. Who knows? But anyway, she was like telling me about Ricky Martin, and she even took a selfie with me, of a picture with her cell phone. She goes, I can't wait to tell all my friends back in Ohio. I, Ricky Martin was on my shit. So I, I'm just trying to say, Lord. Lord. But finally, everyone's complaining. I'm getting ready to complain up there on that counter. And Laura, she says, man, everyone's upset, huh? And I was like, yeah, Laura, because it's been raining nonstop. And honestly, I told her, I said, Laura, I said, how are you so positive about all this? I asked her. And she says, you know, I was one of those angry people yesterday. And I was upset because it was raining. I was upset because I had my plans and everything. And I went downstairs here to complain. You know what I tried to do? I tried to figure out why they wouldn't just go around the store. And I was complaining about that. And wouldn't you know, one of the people that worked for the ship was behind the counter and told me, Laura, the thing is, the captain is able to perfectly go around the storm if he wanted to. He can go around the storm anytime. But sometimes he doesn't. And the reason is, it's because if that captain goes around the storm that's really big, it can actually cause such a detour that it delays everything else. And not only that, the storm, we have enough gas to go to the trip and back. So we can actually run out of gas, have a huge detour, and a huge delay if the storm's too big. The captain can and sometimes does go around the little storms, but some of the storms that come cannot be avoided. And he says to me, the captain's job is not to avoid storms. The captain's job is to get you safely through them. And she goes, and when I heard that, all of my anger went away. And I stood in that line. I still complain. I think I did. I don't remember. But I stood in that line. And I said, Laura, I didn't know that. And I started thinking about it just yesterday. I said, man, I think a lot of us need to understand how God works in our lives. She said something to me the next day as we got to Costa Rica and it was raining. I saw her in the crowd. I tried to avoid her. And with her friends from Ohio, I heard the loudest, Ricky! Ricky! And she said, that's my friend, Ricky Martin. I'm like, girl, you sound so racist right now. And then she just looks at me. She goes, have a good day. Trust the captain. 
and I never forget, Lord. Can I tell you, God is like that captain. You know, a lot of times we think that as Christians, we board this cruise ship, but the ship you actually get on board when you're a believer is not a cruise ship, it's a battleship. And it's a war. And all these problems come into our lives, but there's a certain expectancy that God has to make our lives and our voyage fun and exciting and safe and easy and he's here to serve us and we're like on this Christian little Lido deck enjoying life till we die and go to heaven and if there's a problem God's supposed to just avoid it because God forbid we go through problems in life but that is not how God operates if you want to know how God works let me be your Laura this morning and tell you God does not always avoid storms in your life Does he sometimes? Yes. Can he completely detour you off the problems? Absolutely. But sometimes what you go through is actually best instead of avoiding it. But so many people think that God has to make our lives easy. God has to make our lives happy. God has to avoid problems because when we go through problems, so many people say, well, why is God doing this? And why did God allow this? And this is so unfair. And where is God in all of this? And how can God allow this? And if God is so good, why is there so much evil and problems? And the reason we ask and believe such questions is because we are assuming that God is supposed to make our lives like a good captain, easy, and avoid all these problems. But God, see, God has a responsibility not to avoid storms from hitting us. God's simple responsibility as His children that we are is to get us through them. To get us through the storms that we suffer. So get this mentality out of your head that problems are not supposed to happen to Christians. Problems happen to Christians, but we have the hope and the assurance that we have a loving Father that gets us through the problems in our lives. This is the problem that we read in the book of Hebrews. There's a bunch of Christians that gave their lives to Jesus And all of a sudden, instead of their lives getting better as they thought it would, they started getting persecuted. They started going to jail. They started getting murdered. They started losing loved ones. Their homes were being ransacked and burned. Their children were dying for their faith. And a lot of Christians were confused and saying, hey, wait a minute. Why are we suffering? We gave our lives to Jesus. Life isn't supposed to be this way. God's supposed to protect us. We're supposed to avoid these type of problems because we're Christians and they were confused and they were discouraged because in their minds, they actually thought when they gave their lives to Jesus, it meant that life would be easy. They said, man, we love Jesus. We're working for Jesus. And now we're being persecuted for Jesus. And a lot of them were angry. And they were discouraged. So much so, so discouraged that they actually wanted to go back to their old ways in life. They actually said, we're just going to want to go back. We want to go back to our old selves. Because walking with Jesus, ever since we started walking with Jesus, our lives have been so much harder. Because they thought a life with Jesus would be easy and make their lives easy. But here's the reality of following Christ. Christians still get sick with cancer. Christians still lose their jobs. Christians still have problems with their children. Christians still struggle in their marriage. Christians still suffer under this terrible economy. Christians all alike go through storms. But the thing is, when we have a mindset that God is supposed to avoid problems from our lives, we're missing the greater picture. God gets us through the storms because the storms actually make us better believers. 
but they were discouraged. And here's the truth about discouragement. I don't know if you're discouraged today. I don't know if why you're discouraged. But verse 10 tells us something interesting about discouragement. In verse 10 it says, For God is not unjust so as to forget your work and love which you have shown towards His name. One of the things that the writer of Hebrews tells these Christians as they're going through a hard time, as they're wanting to quit and go back to their old lives, discouragement settled in. And notice that the Bible says God is not unjust and He has not forgotten the work and the love which you have shown towards Him. And if we're honest with ourselves during these problems in our lives, many people are so discouraged because this is what discouragement does. It makes you feel like God has forgotten you. It makes you feel like God is unjust. It's not fair, God. And so many people, when their lives are hard and they're going through discouragement, they think, does God even see what I'm going through right now? Does God even know how I loved Him, how I go to church and I read my Bible and I pray and I'm so much better than half the people out there in the world living in sin and yet I'm so, it's so unfair, Pastor, because I try to do the right thing and all I get is problems, but there's so many people out there that don't even serve Jesus like I do, love Jesus like I do, pray to Jesus like I do, yet I'm the one that goes through problems. This is so unjust. This is so unfair. And these are the exact emotions discouragement tells us. God has forgotten about you and God is unfair. Look at how the wicked prosper and look at you. And it's no wonder these Christians felt so discouraged that they wanted to quit. They wanted to give up. They wanted to go back to their old lives and say, is it even worth following Jesus? Because ever since we started following Jesus, our homes burned down. My husband went to jail. My son died on the streets. We're being persecuted. We can't find work. And life is so hard. And they were so discouraged. Can I tell you that discouragement is so common in so many people in the church today. And with discouragement, there's the temptation to respond to great difficulty and disappointment with why God? When God? How God? God, why did you allow this in my life? God, how long am I going to be in this? How long will I have to endure this? When are you going to finally come through for me? Why can't I avoid this storm? Or why are you letting me go through this? Because you're getting through it. Discouragement can be destructive. Even though it's common, it's very dangerous and destructive. That's why one of the things that God would say to a lot of people in the Bible as they were about to do something great for the Lord, do not be afraid and do not be discouraged. Because when discouragement comes, it can become so easy for you to quit, say, why bother, and go back to your old ways. And Satan uses discouragement. He uses discouragement to get you to focus on all the problems you have, focus on everything that didn't work out, focus on all the plans that failed, and all the hardship you're going through, and as Satan gets you to focus on all of these discouraging troubles in your life, it can actually cause you to lose hope and actually drift away from God. And as a pastor, I've seen more people drift away from God than drift towards Him. And part of the reasons I've seen so many people drift away from God, you guessed it, it's discouragement. I hear it all the time. Well, I used to go to church, but then I got sick. I used to follow Jesus, but then I lost my job. I used to love the Lord, but then all these problems started happening, and I don't understand why God does it, and I just stopped with all of that Jesus stuff. I see it all the time. 
Discouragement is very dangerous because it gets you to drift away from God. In fact, God warns the church in Hebrews about the dangers of discouragement. Look at verse 11 through 12. And we desire that each one of you show the same diligence so as to realize the full assurance of hope until the end. So that you will not be sluggish, but imitators of those who who through faith and patience inherit the promise. I want you to notice what God says here. If you get so discouraged as to drift away from God, Do you know there's a temptation to become a sluggish Christian? Can I tell you, out of love and honesty, there's a lot more sluggish Christianity today than ever before. What does sluggish mean? In the Bible, the word sluggish translates in the Greek and Hebrew, lazy. Lazy. To make no effort. Have you ever felt that sluggish Christianity in your own life? You're so tired of being tired and so discouraged because you're discouraged in all the problems that you become sluggish. What does that mean? Well, maybe you're sluggish in your prayer life. You don't pray like you used to. You don't pray like you should. You don't feel like it. You're saying, well, what's the point? Discouragement keeps you from praying. Maybe you're sluggish in the Word of God and you're lazy. And you don't, oh, I, I want to get up early and read the Bible. I want to go to bed later and read the Bible. I want to, but I'm just so discouraged about everything. Why even bother reading the Word? So many people are sluggish when it comes to the Word of God. We're sluggish when it comes to church. Well, I'll go when I want to. I'll go if I can. I'm just so tired and I have so much going on. And I don't feel like getting up in the morning. To hear Ricky Martin preach. (laughs) You you get what I'm saying. So many of us get so discouraged, we can become sluggish. We get sluggish with church and prayer and Bible. We get sluggish with fellowship. I don't feel like being around other people. We get sluggish with serving. And here's the danger. When you're so discouraged and become sluggish and lazy towards the things of God, it becomes easier for you to compromise and fall into temptation and sin. Galatians 5.16 tells us this. The Bible says, but I say walk in the Spirit. Notice that. Walk by the Spirit. Walk with God. And you will not carry out the desires of your flesh. When you have a strong walk with the Lord, the desire doesn't mean you won't have the desire, but it means you won't carry it out. You become a lot stronger in the faith, a lot more stable in in the Spirit, where you don't carry out the desires of the flesh. But what happens if you're so discouraged, it leads you to be so sluggish that you're not walking in the Spirit. You're not walking in prayer. You're not walking in the Word of God. You're not really coming to church. You're not fellowshipping. You're not serving. When you don't walk in the Spirit, guess what's going to happen? Naturally, it's going to become a lot easier for you to give in, to compromise in the flesh. And that's why the devil loves discouragement, because discouragement makes us sluggish. Sluggish leads to compromise. Compromise leads to destruction. And the worst thing ever is that you become so involved in the flesh that there's a part of you like these Christians in Hebrews that just won't, they wanted to go back. That's what's mind-blowing to me. They wanted to go back to their old ways. And maybe, just maybe, you're so discouraged today that it's made you lazy. And you're so lazy that it's affected your walk with God. And your walk with God is so affected, you're doing things and compromising in ways you thought you never would anymore. And maybe, just maybe, there's a temptation to just go back to your old life. Go back to who I used to be. Life was easier then. If you're discouraged, let me help you. The book of Hebrew provides some key principles for hope. Hope is the opposite of discouragement. But hope doesn't come when the bills are paid. Hope doesn't come if the president changes. 
Hope doesn't come if you get a raise. Hope doesn't come if your problems go away. Hope can only be achieved through Jesus Christ. And Hebrew provides these key principles for hope. And it tells us what it is, why it's so important, and how do we get it. So this is a simple teaching I want to give you this morning. If you're discouraged, how to get your hope up. How to get your hope back up. And why do you need this message? Well, maybe you're not discouraged, but you will be one day. Maybe you're discouraged right now. So today, I want to give you these three simple, hopeful principles. What is hope? Verse 19. We have this hope as an anchor for our soul. Firm and secure. God says, well, hope is like an anchor. Now, when you say the Bible, when the Bible uses the word hope, the word hope literally means a confident expectation of something good and better for you. That's the easiest, simplest way we can define hope. A confident expectation of something good and better for you. And God says hope is like an anchor. Why did God say hope is like an anchor? Well, anchors do two things and two things that we need to learn today. Number one, hope keeps us like an anchor. Anchors keep you from drifting away. And when you have hope, I guarantee it's a lot harder for you to drift away from God. Back to your old ways. You know who drifts away from God? People that have no hope. People that have no expectations of something good happening for their life. And when you live with that false negative expectation that nothing's good's going to happen, you lose hope and you begin to drift away from God. That's why God says hope is like an anchor. Why? Because hope keeps you from drifting away from God. And why is it so important that you keep a boat from drifting? Because if you don't, it can head into a lot of trouble. It can run aground. It can hit rocks. It can hit bottom. It can sink. It is not good for a boat to drift. So why is an anchor so important like hope? Because when you drift away from God, it's only a matter of time that you hit trouble. And in order to avoid drifting from God, as many people have, you got to get your hope back in the Lord. Not only does hope keep you from drifting, but whenever you go through a serious storm, for example, during hurricane season, if you ever see a hurricane heading towards Miami, some, or heading towards Florida, you're going to see something interesting. You're going to see a bunch of these mega yachts and ships and beautiful boats get away from the harbor, get away from the marina, and they're going to go out into the middle of the ocean before the storm comes, and they're going to drop an anchor on the bow, and they're going to drop an anchor on the stern, in the front of the boat and behind the boat. Why? Because if you tie down to that marina or to that piling, that hurricane is going to destroy the boat. But see, the captain knows it has to go out into the middle of the ocean. It drops the anchor, and that anchor keeps the boat stable. So it rides the storm out, and the boat survives. You see, God said hope is like that anchor. It's going to keep you drifting away from me and head to trouble. And when that storm hits that you cannot avoid, it's going to keep you stable where you won't drown. Hope is the expectation that something good is coming. That's why verse 9, when the Bible is talking about all these Christians that are discouraged and hopeless because of their problems, the writer of Hebrew in verse 9 says, but beloved, that's a term for Christians, beloved, we are convinced Of what? Better things. And maybe today that's all you need to hear. That better days are coming. Better things are happening. How do you know 
if you've lost hope. Look at verse 9. How do you know if you've lost hope? Because you can be in church and lost hope. You can worship and sing songs and lost hope. You can preach like I am right now and lost hope. You know how many times I've preached up here discouraged? How do you know? Well, you can find out if you've lost hope by answering a simple question. The Bible says, beloved, we are convinced of better things. All you have to ask yourself if you want to know whether you've lost hope this morning is what are you convinced about? Let me give you an example. Are you convinced right now nothing in your life is ever going to change? Are you convinced right now it's never going to get better? Are you convinced right now you're the worst person in the world and God hates you? Are you convinced that God is somehow done with you? Or do you stand here despite anything you're going through and say it's hard what I'm going through, it's difficult what I've done, but I know my God and better days are ahead. I'm going through it right now, but I know this isn't forever. I know that God is up to something good. That's how you know whether you've lost hope or not. Ask this question, what am I convinced about? People that have lost hope are not convinced that better is coming, that good is happening for them. When you talk to a discouraged person, they are convinced that life will never change. Life will never get better for me. It's always going to be hard. It's always going to be this way. And that's exactly how the devil whispers to a discouraged person. Hope is the expectation of something good and greater and better. But why is it so important? Verse 11. And we desire that each one of you show the same diligence so as to realize the full assurance of hope until the end. Why is it so important that you have hope? It's not so that you feel good. It's because hope leads to diligence. That word diligence means to make great effort towards. It means to make committed efforts and work towards something. So when you've lost hope, you become lazy. But when you have hope, you get diligent. And you work towards something because you know and have the hope that it's going to get better. 2 Peter 1, 5 through 8. Peter says this to a church. Now for this very reason also applying all what? All diligence. As Christians, we can't be lazy. As Christians, he says, you better apply all diligence to your faith. You might have faith in Jesus, but my question is this morning, does your faith have diligence? He says, with all diligence in your face, supply moral excellence and in your moral excellence, knowledge. And with your knowledge, self-control. And with self-control, notice, perseverance. And in your perseverance, godliness. And in your godliness, brotherly kindness. And in your brotherly kindness, love. For these qualities, these diligent qualities, for these qualities are yours and are increasing. They render you neither what? Useless or unfruitful. If you don't want to be a useless, unfruitful Christian, which many are, you got to be more diligent. you got to make the effort, put in the effort. And one of the ways that you become fruitful and increase it's hope. Hope is what enables a person to have diligence. If you've lost hope, you have no diligence. That's why you become sluggish. But when you have diligence and you have hope that, they, that things are going to get better, that diligence, the Bible literally says, is going to push you to have more self-control, to have perseverance, to have moral excellence, knowledge, and love, and be fruitful and useful. Why? Because diligence is a vital necessity in the life of a believer. You know why Christians don't change? And why problems happen so much and they never, get, they never get anywhere with God? It's because 
They are lazy. Without diligence, God says you render useless. So let me give you an example. If you've ever been on a diet, like I am right now, you step on the, you work towards everything and you eat right and all that, and you step on the scale and you gain two pounds. You ever been there? I know my extra two pounds is muscle. I know that. But it doesn't feel like that. So you know the first thing in my mind? It's hopeless. And when a fat person feels hopeless, where do they go? To the fridge? To Polonote? The nearest McDonald's? Why? I'm not going to be diligent anymore in this. I'm not going to put in the effort. Why? Well, because it's hopeless. I'll never lose weight. It's hopeless. So I'm just going to be lazy and give up. And that's what we do with the things of God in our lives. I see this in married couples when they go through discouraging times and they're hopeless. When a husband thinks his marriage is hopeless, he stops putting in all the effort. When a wife thinks her marriage is hopeless, she stops being diligent and putting all the effort towards her marriage. Why? Well, why bother? Why should I be nice to her? Why should I give her flowers? Why should I be kind? Why should I be intimate? Why should I go on dates? Why should I be a better husband? Why should I respect them? Well, because that level of diligence and moral excellence might actually make your marriage better. But if you're hopeless, you're not going to do it. Why is hope so important? Because hope makes us diligent. Some people lose hope when people are lost in their lives and don't know the Lord. And they say it's hopeless. They'll never come to Jesus. So you get lazy. You stop inviting them. You stop talking to them about the Lord. You just stop believing and stop praying for them. Because when you lose hope, you lose diligence. When you lose diligence, you become sluggish. When you become sluggish, you fall more into sin. When you fall more into sin, You get tempted to drift away from God. When you drift away from God, you're rendered useless to His kingdom. When you render useless to His kingdom, the devil says, I win. Is this good teaching this morning? Last one. How do I get my hope back up? Verse 12 and 13. It's not complicated. The hard part of this message is diligence. Because diligence has to be applied to your faith even no matter what you're going through. So that you will not be sluggish, but imitators of those who through faith and patience, through faith and patience, through faith and what? Patience. Inherit the promise. How do you get your hope back? It takes faith. It takes patience. As you're waiting on God, you're diligent in serving Him. Diligent in doing the right thing. Diligent. Got to keep going. Got to keep going. And the reason that you keep going is because you know you have hope that things are going to get better. God says, how do you get hope? Faith and patience. You hold on to the promises, God says. You hold on to the promise of His Word in spite of the circumstances of your life, and you wait for the Lord. I wish I could give you a a better, more complex explanation of how to get hope, but God makes it so easy. The problem is we are so lazy, we don't get it. The way that you get hope, God says, is faith and patience. Faith in no matter what I feel, no matter what I'm going through, no matter how bad things are, my faith says I'm going to hold on to the promises of God because His Word has the ultimate authority over everything in my life. And as I wait in faith for the Lord, I'm going to hold on to His promises and be patient. Verse 13 gives us an example of hope. And I love this this example because He wasn't perfect. Are you going to have perfect, absolute hope? No. You and I are going to be faithful. We're going to wait on God. 
But sometimes we're going to fail and make mistakes. Amen? And when God made this promise to Abraham, yeah, that Abraham, the one that listened to his wife when his wife came and said, hey, it's been too long, it's been 25 years, why don't you sleep with my maidservant? And Abraham, being the husband that he was, said, yes, dear, whatever you say. And when God made this promise to Abraham, the promise that he's going to be a father, since he could swear by no one greater, he swore by himself. An example of hope God wants to use is Abraham. Why? Well, Romans 4, 18 through 21, it says this. Even when there was no reason for what? Isn't that a beautiful statement? Even if there was no reason for hope, that's Abraham's life could be measured in this way. You have no reason to have hope. Remember, hope is the expectation of something good and better for you. And Abraham's, when you saw Abraham's life, there was nothing to indicate things were going to get better. There was nothing to indicate that good was coming. And the Bible says even when there was no reason for hope, because you're not, sometimes you're going to have no reason to have hope. Abraham kept hoping, believing that he would become the father of many nations. He kept believing. What did he believe? Well, for God has said to him, that's how many descendants you will have. And Abraham's what? Faith did not weaken, even though at about 100 years of age, he figured his body was good as dead. And so was Sarah's womb. Abraham never wavered in believing God's promise. In fact, his faith grew stronger. And this, he brought glory to God. He was fully what? You see that? How do you know you have hope? What are you convinced about? Abraham was good as dead. When the Bible calls you old, you know you're old. He was fully convinced that God is able. Come on, give God praise for that one. He says, God is fully able. So his body, you know, it was so bad that his own wife laughed. When Abraham was excited about what God was going to do, she laughed. She said, you're good as dead. You're old. No way it's going to happen. But even he had no reason for hope. The Bible says Abraham was convinced that God is able. And that is what some of us need today. You need to be convinced that better days are coming. And the way that you strengthen your hope is by being convinced that our God is able. He's able. You hold on to His promises. You may not have a reason for hope, but hope is not only the expectation of greater and better and good coming, but hope is what keeps us diligent as we wait with faith and patience. And hope tells us God is able. Why do we hope? Because there's a God. Let's all stand and we pray for you. Father, thank you for this service. Thank you for this work. Thank you for this Labor Day weekend. Father, as we sit here, I pray for everyone here today that might have come to church discouraged, wondering why you can't avoid storms. Why did you allow us to go through things? And in this room today, there's people that are hurt, scared, ultimately discouraged, Lord, they've lost hope. But I pray that something in them will just spark and ignite this faith and truth to keep hope alive and stay diligent, working towards the things they're dreaming for because you are a God who is able. And if, Ab if 
Abraham was good as dead, but yet you fulfilled his promise. Lord, no matter where we are in our lives, how bad things look, what we've done, there is a hope that you are able to do the impossible. So fill us with hope in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Come on, give God some praise today. God bless you all.